number of elements that it doesn't have. But it isn't tied into the National Guard. It's a separate entity. And it has only about 60-something thousand people. So it clearly is not in any way uh, pretending to universality. But most states have nothing. As I said, Virginia has nothing. Rhode Island has nothing. New Hampshire has nothing. Right? And Connecticut has some ceremonial units left over from the colonial period. But they don't perform any of these functions. They're entirely ceremonial. So the question is, well, how does one go about reorganizing this? And the first point is, this system has to be tied into <coughs> this system. Because to be a constitutional militia, a militia of the several states, it has to be a state entity. And it is being the state entity that gives it the immunity from the federal government. Not being organized in some way and calling itself a militia, a bunch of guys getting together in the woods with camouflage outfits. They have no immunity from the federal government. They may have immunity from common sense, but not from the federal government. <laughs> and they probably have no immunity from their state or county or city government either, which they haven't thought through, all right? <laughs> it's this connection. And we know that this is the connection, not only because the Constitution tells us that, the militia of the several states, but because if you go back and look at the way these things were structured, every last one of them came out of a statute, or in the very early days, a colonial charter, which was a grant from the king essentially the same as the statute. There was never one, I've never found one, I'd love to see it, that was formed by private individuals on their own initiative, separate and independent from any part of their colonial government. It did not exist. In fact, the only time somebody tried to do it was Benjamin Franklin in the colony of Pennsylvania. The colony of Pennsylvania was run by the Quakers. And the Quakers, of course, were what, and still are, essentially pacifists, all right? They don't want to bear arms. And they were in control of the legislature of Pennsylvania. They didn't want to pass a statute to force anyone else to bear arms. <laughs> so for a long period of time, the Quakers resisted passing a militia statute. And Franklin came along and said, well, I'll finesse this. We'll pass a statute, but it will be voluntary participation. So the Quakers cannot say that they are coercing anyone. That statute went to the Privy Council in England, the King's inner circle, as all statutes did, for approval or disapproval. And it was disapproved. And it was disapproved precisely on the point that it was not a compulsory organization. Finally, in the 1770s, the War of Independence comes along, even the Quakers had to give up. And they passed a series of statutes quite quickly, providing for the same type of structure as the rest of the colonies had. So the one example of the other side of this coin, the idea that you can start a voluntary organization calling yourself a militia, the King of England said was wrong, and rightly so. Even Franklin had to figure out this kind of, kind of convoluted way to get around that problem. So you need this connection, which means at some point you have to have a statute passed, which means at some point you have to educate some legislators. Now don't say that's impossible. <laughs> Because educators, the education of legislators is really the result of feedback from this group, from the people themselves. Right? Most state legislators are more likely to be convinced by their constituents than your typical congressman is. And it certainly would be possible in some states actually to do this at the county level. Right? I'm not trying to complicate this by adding another layer to it, but it would be possible to bring it down even further the system. It's leaving at the state level. So the process has to be to educate the legislators in, in order to obtain a statute. And that first requires educating whom? Well, the people themselves. They have a big problem of educating the people themselves. So what I point out in this book is that the first thing that needs to be done is the formation of some essentially activist organizations. And Walter will talk about that in a moment committees of safety being an example, because I don't call them that. I call them Citizens Homeland Security Association, so I could be very uh, neutral. Right. It doesn't sound very threatening to people, right? It could mean almost anything. That's the beauty of political terms. It could mean almost anything. But we know it. I mean, the book we know. And these essentially start with a few folks and their neighbors getting together, discussing this problem. And the idea is to form relatively small groups, 50 people, 
people, 60 people, something that's both functional but capable of control. You don't want something that's so large that half the people never show up, and you don't even know who they are. And then they would, in fact, look at the quote unquote homeland security problems in their particular area. So we take the state of Virginia, we have Norfolk, the naval base. We're right next to the District of Columbia, a whole different set of problems. We have a large part of the state that's very rural. The Shenandoah Valley could probably survive by itself if we just cut off from the rest of Virginia. The rest of Virginia floated out to the Atlantic. The Shenandoah Valley would do perfectly well. We have a couple of large urban areas like Richmond, which will need a lot of organizing to straighten them out. So you have lots of different problems. And the point is, at this stage, this organizational structure is to a large extent experimental. It hasn't been done in over a century. And the problems are different, the resources are different, and we have to put those two together in some way. So the organizations form, they start thinking about these problems. They come up with essentially wish lists of what they need to see in a statute. And then through a statewide committee, somebody like myself and others sit down with this, we sit down with the state code, and we draft the first militia statute. And it will look something like this money statute. It won't be complete. It'll be the foot in the door. Get the thing started. And then these folks who have organized themselves, they will have made contact with their local state legislators. Some of them on board. Some of them will probably be convinced. Some of them will probably be afraid of opposing it because they know there's a very large constituency in favor of it thing gets into the legislature, and one hopes that the first experimental stage passes. And the beauty of this structure is that when the legislator puts in the bill, he not only says, oh, I have some number of people in my district who want this bill passed, but he also says, I have some number of people in my district who, when this bill is passed, will volunteer to perform these initial militia functions actual functions under the statute. So it's not a pie in the sky operation. It will actually take off and give an example uh, to the rest of the society. Now what I'm drafting in Virginia, because I happen to live there, is a statute that follows this structure. And it goes one step further. It says we're giving to the counties the authority to set these things up. It's a statewide organization. But initially, each county is going to set up its own county motion. And it will initially be done by volunteers. And we're going to give these volunteers certain benefits to entice them in. <laughs> and large numbers of people are allowed to exempt themselves, and then they pay a very small fee for exempting themselves. So they don't have to go to a minimum level of training each year. Well, if you take about 6 million people, 5.5 million people, times $5 a piece exemption, how much money? by million, right? That's a pretty good starting point in those counties because it will be fed to those counties that are actually performing the, the experimental function. It's a pretty good starting point to get some of these things rolling. And after a short period of time, this particular statute, I say something like six or eight months because it should, it should, you don't need a lot of time to see how this is going to work. They come back to the state legislature, which has set up an evaluation commission. And the Evaluation Commission takes this information and says, okay, now we're going to amend this statute to take advantage of all of this work that's been done at this level. And one or two iterations of that process will get you something that will look very much like the colonial statute, except much more comprehensive. And I know that because I've already drafted it. Okay. And it's already in the works. I know how this thing's supposed to come out. And I think any lawyer who looked at this would know how it was supposed to come out. It wouldn't be me necessarily. Anyone who really studied this would see how it would have to be done. Now, what's the selling point here? Well, one of the selling points, which Walter will tell you, is, is this money problem. I mean, people are now scared to death of this and its consequences. So if you couldn't sell a militia reformulation or revitalization program, simply on the basis that the Constitution requires it. Why is that important? We're electing people that aren't eligible for the presidency. Why, what difference does this make? It's because if you don't 